Okay, everybody, welcome to uh, Zero to PCI in 50 minutes. My name is Nathan Cooper, and uh, get comfortable because we're going to be talking about absolutely fascinating things for the next 50 minutes. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you were here in my previous presentation, I recommended that you bring a pillow and, if possible, a spare for me. So, to start out, uh, I'd like to thank some of the companies. Uh, doing the research for this was not uh, the easiest thing I've ever done. Uh, but these companies definitely helped me out. Full disclosure, that one in the upper right is Lucid Software. That's the company I work for. And uh, besides giving me the time to work on this, uh, at, they also gave me money in the same bag. So uh, up there on the top left uh, and bottom right, Braintree and Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, these were two, two banks or acquiring banks that I spoke with to kind of get an idea from the business side on their side. Uh, what PCI meant to them and what the process should look like. Uh, down in the lower left, Security Metrics is a local company here in Utah that does vulnerability scanning and uh, uh, audits as well. They have a whole bunch of QSAs that I, I have uh, grown to love. So um, before getting into PCI, um, let's talk about me because that's awesome. Uh, I again, if uh, if you're here for the first presentation, this is a little bit boring. But uh, you know, if you weren't, I'd hate for you to miss out on this. So when I was a kid, I really loved magic. Uh, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And Arthur Clarke's third rule of technology is that uh, technology sufficiently advanced is indecipherable or indistinguishable from magic. And I think that's definitely true in the security space. Um, my uncle got me into lock picking when I was a kid, and besides, you know, a, a passion for teaching and consulting and all that other fun stuff, uh, I pretty much cemented myself in as a child of two worlds, meaning business and uh, security IT. So, given only, I, I hope I'm not going to burst anybody's bubble, but it actually takes longer than 50 minutes to become PCI compliant. Go figure. What I would like to do during the 50 minutes allotted to me is give you an idea of the sort of process and feelings that you're likely to experience while going through the process of certification. Thus, uh, so with most things red and tapey, PCI can be a little bit of a beast, but it doesn't need to be so bad. Uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, though. What First off is PCI. We're going to do some quick definitions, glossary type stuff. So PCI uh, stands for Payment Card Industry, and it is basically a collection of very large credit card companies, all of whom have a vested interest in keeping yours and my uh, credit card data secure. Because anytime it's not secure, they typically end up paying out of their nose. Um, in turn, they end up raising merchant fees, they end up raising interest rates, so it ends up trickling down to all of us, though. Uh, they, cre they elect a set of individuals to make up this PCI council, which basically define policy for anybody who's going to have anything to do with credit card data. So that's called the PCI DSS, which is the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards. Uh, these are the sets of policies, definitions, whatnot uh, that anybody who's going to be processing credit card data have to abide by. Now, credit card data is a kind of a funny thing, and this is one of th this this is one of the parts that actually got me confused initially because their definition is, at a minimum, credit card data consists of the full PAN, so your numbers. Credit card data may also appear in the form of the full PAN plus any of the following, cardholder name, expiration date, and or service code. See sensitive authentication data for additional data elements that may be transmitted or processed but not stored as part of the payment transaction. So besides being a wonderful example of the English language, uh, it's a little bit dry, but basically the PAN, which is the number, and anything else constitutes credit card data, or the PAN by itself constitutes credit card data. Oh, and um, mini side note. Anybody, I, I, I am fully confident there's several people in this room that are way smarter than me. So if I begin to lead everyone astray, please you know, kindly raise your hand and uh, take me back. 
QSAs are supposed to be opinionated, so I, I expect that. Uh, credit card data environment. This is kind of a fun one, but basically anything that has anything to do with credit card data. Not exactly literally, but close. Again, the people, processes, and technology that store, process, or transmit credit card data or sensitive authentication data. Uh, an important note to make is that this is different from in scope. You can have things that are in the environment that aren't necessarily within scope, and you can definitely have things that are outside of your environment that are very, very much in scope. So, um, in this case, actually I'm going to come back to this example, but uh, in the example I'll use a little bit later on, that central corporate server, or um, yeah, service is going to be what we consider to be the credit card data holder. Okay, in order to in order to show that you are PCI compliant, you have to fill out one of these SAQs, which is a self-assessment questionnaire. They are fun. They're like your standardized test on steroids, except it exposes all of the, the creepy little nasty things inside your data environment that you never really wanted to look at. Um, they are really good for you to go through. And I will make a point that you can implement the, the requirements here and still have a secure system. In fact, if you do it the right way, they can help you quite a bit. Part of filling out the SAQ uh, for most individuals is having a, an approved scanning vendor. This is an outside third party that will, on a quarterly basis, basically run an external vulnerability scan against your systems on all of the public facing interfaces. So the, these are not too expensive, they're actually pretty cheap, and they can pick up some good low hanging fruit. Note that they are always updating their signatures, and so whereas you may have been passing from an ASV perspective at one point, uh, standards, definitions, may have changed to where you're no longer passing and you do have to actually update your system uh, to match that. Uh, also, there are different requirements based on whether you're a merchant or a provider. Uh, if you are a merchant, it means that you are selling stuff and accepting credit card data. Not necessarily that you're storing it. In fact, if you are, if you are storing PCI data as part of your service, say you're uh, some kind of file storage mechanism like Box or Dropbox, and you tell them you can store PCI data with us, then you are a provider and you have kind of a separate set of requirements. Uh, they're really close, they're about the same thing, but you have additional hoops you have to jump through. So in most cases, you've got like a 100 to 1 thing where there's a lot of merchants, not nearly so many providers. Uh, at Lucid Software, for example, um, we, we store data, we store customer data and diagrams, that kind of thing. And many of our customers have asked us, you know, can we store PCI data with you? Emphatically, we respond, no. You, that is not one of our supported circumstances that you would be doing at your own risk and that would also make you non-compliant. So don't do that. Uh, a QSA is required depending on your merchant level. And we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a second as well. That is basically a third party individual who comes into your company and helps you either fill out the SAQ or they perform their own PCI audit, filling out essentially their own SAQ for you. Now they work with you, it may go for like two weeks, you know, every day in and out. And they will comb every little bit of your system. They will, by the way, they can help you if they're a good QSA they will help you. They won't write your code, they won't change your rules, but they can help you reduce scope, which as we'll talk about later on, is a huge thing. They can be your best friend. Remember that if you're accepting credit card data, you have to go through these processes anyway. The QSA can make it better, can make it easier. So in preparing for your assessment, there's a few key things that you really should do. And this, you might wanna do even before you talk to your QSA. Uh, if you happen to need one. And we'll go over that, I promise. There's a lot to, a lot to visit. You need to perform infrastructure recon. This, uh, at its most basic, is understanding your data infrastructure, your network infrastructure, and the data flows. Uh, basically, where 
is payment information coming into your system? How does it interact with your system? Uh, there are uh, several solutions out there that help you to reduce your responsibility under PCI. Um, but if your system has the ability to affect the security of the PCI data, more than likely you're still going to be under obligation to do this sort of stuff. Even if you're one of those individuals who like just has like a Foursquare chip on their phone and you're swiping stuff, somebody along the line, you know, has to answer the hard questions. I and in those cases, those are called uh, accumulators. Um, Foursquare is going to be answering those questions in behalf of all of their clients. So, um, understand your system. Uh, at there are a lot of tools that you can use to do this. Lucid Software, Lucid Chart, we have a plugin that helps you, especially if you're in AWS, but you can do networking diagramming. But we're not the only one by far. There, uh, you can use Visio, of course, though you might rather just shoot yourself in the foot. Um, th but there's some also online tools that are specifically geared towards that type of thing, and you really need to have a good one of these. It may start out with a rough one and then become increasingly you know, complex. But make sure that you spend some good uh, TLC with your network diagram and understanding where the flows go because, honestly, it's way not fun to go through this whole process and then find out that besides your website, uh, sales guys are also taking credit cards. You're like, oh, uh, over the phone. Mm, start over. So uh, merchant level, uh, how many transactions, how many unique credit card transactions does your company do during a year? This can most effectively be answered by your bank. So definitely ask them. Uh, alternatively, uh, they should actually tell you what PCI merchant level you're supposed to be anyway. Uh, if they don't, uh, you can use this kind of diagram. Basically, if you're less than 20,000, you're level four, uh, you have one million and then six million, and then that you know gives you two, three, and then above that, you're gonna be, um, oh, sorry, Three, two. And then above that, you're going to be a level one merchant or provider. Uh, next, identifying the SAQ that you have to fill out. That's pretty much determined by whether or not you store credit card data and how that data ends up coming to you. Whether it's over the phone, whether you have a kiosk, or whether or not it comes through a third party system. Uh, for example, in the case of Lucid Software, we host a website and then we have embedded in that JavaScript that goes out to uh, essentially our subscription uh, third-party service. And the data never actually goes to Lucid software. It goes to our third-party service. So we can honestly say we never touch the data. However, we still have to fill out this kind of thing because we have the ability to impact that data. You can imagine what would happen if there was some malicious JavaScript that ended up getting served on that same page. So it's a good thing to remember. Uh, again, I've got a slightly more complex diagram, and these these are available online, so I don't want to spend too much too much time on this. But again, uh, from from right to left uh, is more or less, with the exception of D in the middle, uh, the ease of the SAQ. Uh, SAQ A has like 13 questions. Uh, you can you can do it in your lunch break, uh, essentially. Uh, SAQ AEP is quite a quite a bit more. Uh, that was what we did the first time. Uh, SAQD uh, down there, sec or third from the right, is basically what everything, uh, that's the hardest one. That's the, that's the full kit with the Boodle. If you don't fall into one of these other nice categories, you have to do that one. Okay, so another tool. Uh, yeah. Um, that's not what I understood, but I can't tell you you're wrong because I haven't heard anything of that like, so it could be just I didn't hear anything. Um, as I understand it, though, uh, there are still the ability to do those easier ones, but I'll definitely have to check. When I looked at uh, the portal that our merchant bank uh, uses for us to submit that information, it still has those different SAQs as options. Oh, and that's actually, that's a, that's a fantastic aside again. The, one of the easiest ways to go through this process 
is to use the tools that your merchant bank or your acquiring bank uh, provides you. And I didn't even know about this. I went through and I started researching PCI from scratch, basically. And I went out and had filled out all the forms by hand. And I was getting ready to, you know, like lick the stamp, put on the envelope, and send it off to the government because that's as much as I knew uh, I had to do. And it turns out that's actually not correct. Anyway, you have to send it to your acquiring bank. When I went and contacted them and said, how do I get this to you? They said, well, you actually need to use this other product that we actually pay money for that helps you fill those out. And, you know, I was like, oh. I realized that I could have saved myself a whole lot of pain, and, and hence this presentation. I'm trying to save you a little bit of that pain. Uh, because they already had provided several of the tools, including an external uh, approved uh, scanning vendor, or an ASV. Uh, they had actually already paid for that, and we had paid for it as well. So save yourself time and money, and check what tools your bank has for you. Okay, risk assessment. Realistically, everybody needs one of these things. Um, uh, maybe it doesn't have to be quite so detailed and arduous in your own personal life if you wanted to have your own risk assessment. But definitely, your company needs to understand what its threats, what its risks are, in order to govern your security program. Basically, this risk assessment should guide almost all of everything you do as a security engineer or advocate. Um, specifically, a security risk assessment is required for PCI, so you're going to have to do it at some point or another. And this can also help save you a little bit of time and hassle down the way. So try and get some of this done. Uh, PCI DSS actually has, or the PCI Council has released uh, a security guideline, or so, sorry, security risk assessment guideline, which is available if you just do a search for PCI DSS risk assessment guideline. Uh, you'll find that. Scoping. Now the, the QSAs that I spoke with uh, ask that I emphasize just one thing, and that is scoping. If there's anything you can do to save yourself time and hassle and money and tears and possibly a trip to the doctor, um, perhaps mental or otherwise, get your scoping right. Spend time on it. And you don't want to reduce the scope too small. A scoping is basically everything you have to take into consideration when filling out the SAQ. Uh, there'll be things like um, you need to have firewall limitations on everything that's in the cardholder data environment. And if you don't have your scoping right, that could mean every single little you know node in your entire infrastructure and beyond, because you know, you know, perhaps so and so has a phone that is connected to our wireless and the corporate wireless, and the corporate wireless is connected to the you know production network somehow through some obfuscated channel. And if you don't do your scoping right, you know, you have that responsibility. It'll just bleed through your entire system, and you'll have no idea where to stop. And that is honestly where most people get frustrated is because their scope is too large. Now, if your scope, again, is too small, it means you're going to have to redo it anyway. Now, the, the amount of risk that your company is willing to take on kind of defines, again, how liberal you are with applying scope uh, up to a point. Obviously, you can't just say, wow, we're happy with all of the risk, and we're just going to mark yes on everything. Uh, not doesn't quite work like that because, as we've seen in previous examples, uh, if you ever do have a breach, you will n probably not be PCI compliant. And the forensics team will show that. That's just kind of how it works. So you can show that you were at least trying. And if you weren't trying, then things get really bad. There is a PCI open source scoping document online that I really encourage you to look at because it gives a lot of guidance. It was written by several members of the PCI Council, uh, as well as some other external help. Uh, it was, it's a little bit older. I believe it was written in like 2012 or something. Isn't it funny that that's older now? Man, I'm, I'm ancient. But it helps you kind of identify what is um, what we term as contagious or infectious items within your environment. The, the red circle there in the middle is the actual data. That's, of course, in scope. The systems that are holding the actual data 
are, of course, in scope. Any systems that have uncontrolled or unlimited access to those systems are also in that category one. Uh, category three, really, really simple. It's stuff that has nothing to do with anything that even smells of PCI. It's that category two is kind of where it gets a little bit um, mushy and you have to try and figure things out. Basically, stuff that can affect the security of category one devices or data would be in category two, but it has to be controlled. We're talking it, it goes through restricting uh, perimeters. Uh, as an example, uh, if you had a file in your file system that was full of credit card numbers, that's obviously category one. If you had that on a Samba share that anybody could reach to, everybody who's within that network, you know, those would be category one devices. Let's say it's closed off though. Uh, only, only one system can hit it and you need to have this absolutely super secure password in order to get at it. That might be more of a category two device and is therefore non-infectious. You don't have to extend scope beyond that perimeter. Uh, as a more practical example, say you've got uh, that router in the middle is kind of connecting everybody to the internet who's on the right side and bottom. Let's say that on the far right, the server that's in the middle of that uh, vertical three cluster has the PCI data. Uh, there's a printer and uh, the database obviously is what's, what's holding it. The database has the actual data. The server has that database mounted, which means that they're both category one devices, definitely in scope. There is a printer that's on that same network that has unrestricted access to that infrastructure, also kind of a category one device. Now, the firewall and the switch, and the switches, depending on how intelligent they are, may or may not be a perimeter. Uh, that firewall definitely constitutes a perimeter, but that firewall itself is going to be in scope. And there are PCI rules that deal with firewalls and routers and whatnot. Now, depending on what the firewall rules are, what kind of protocols are allowed through it, that scope may still extend all the way over to the router. And again, depending on whether or not the router locks down traffic to and from the PCI environment, it could be. So if we say that that laptop that's in the bottom right is an admin's laptop, and he's going to be connecting to the data environment, it's going to be in scope. Anybody who can get that data, anybody and their devices are going to be in scope. Common pitfalls. It is dark. You're likely to be eaten by a screw. Or overcomplications. This is one of the things that I fell into, as I mentioned. I had tried to do all of this on my own when I actually had a whole set of tools that the bank had provided me that I could have used. Also, if you overscope, which I did by a long shot, uh, it leads to pain, especially on your employees, which makes, uh, makes you the enemy of your entire security infrastructure, which is not a good thing. Um, we had to put overly stringent restrictions on what our employees could do because we had initially overscoped. Now, thankfully, we were able to pull that back after, after a little bit of uh, consultation and external help. But really, don't let PCI freak you out. Just kind of take it in stride. It's got like 12 different sections. You can kind of break those out and just, just focus on one at a time. Look at it. Uh, don't, don't try and do it all in one week because you're not going to. Uh, also, the, on, on the SAQ, each option pretty much has a yes, which is great, we conform, a no, which is bad, meaning we don't conform, and an NA for not applicable. Now, if you do a no, you have to have some kind of explanation as to why you're doing that. Mitigating um, controls that you have in place that make that not really a big deal, and plans, uh, if it's bad enough, on how you're going to become, become compliant in the very, very near future. If you have an NA, you have to put an explanation. Uh, try and reduce the amount of times you put no, unless there's a really good reason because almost universally, the mitigating controls that you put around it are gonna be more complicated than the actual compliance itself. 
Now, in some cases, that's not the case. Like a, a good friend company of ours talked about how um, they don't uh, they don't change passwords every 90 days because they have this other particular set of requirements for their passwords that helps increase their longevity. Now, if you have a QSA, they might argue with you with you on that, or your merchant bank might argue with you on that, and you're going to have to settle. Ultimately, the merchant bank is going to be right, just like the customer. So you'll have to go along with them because they're the ones who actually call the shots. Um, yeah. Da, da, da. Again, make sure that after you, since you've defined your scope right before you've tried to go through the SAQ. Um, when you read the questions and you start thinking, oh, this is going to be so horrible. Realistically, you know, go back, consult your scope, see if it's really all that bad. And, and in some cases, you know, mitigating controls are going to be appropriate. Uh, next pitfall, incorrectly defined scope. Now, we've already kind of kicked this beast around a couple of times. You need to, you got to cut it off somewhere. Make sure that you have a good argument where you're cutting it off and make sure that you know, there are actual security membranes, parameter or perimeters that uh, define that cutoff. Uh, if you miss in scope items again, you're going to have to go back and do a whole bunch of stuff, and that's that's a pain for everyone. Um, nobody wants you to do a security audit and then have you come back again and say, "Oh, just just kidding. We got to answer some more questions." Uh, dark side of compliance. So, I do this in my Yoda voice, but my my throat's a little bit uh, rough. better, but I'm still not going to do it in my Yoda voice. But ultimately, you get frustrated with PCI. If you let yourself get to that point, you're going to start making stupid decisions. You're going to start going the easy route. You're going to throw up your hands and say, oh, this PCI forces me to be less secure. And ultimately, you know, that's a bad choice. <laughs> that's a bad choice. I tell my son, was that a good choice or a bad choice? He says, it was a bad choice, Dad. So given, given a PCI requirement and what you're already doing right now, which might be awesome, by the way, you're, if the requirement doesn't quite line up, you're going to have several options. Some of them are going to be better than others. Um, some of them might be, well, according to the letter of the law, you know, we could just remove this out of our system, this, this security feature, and, and then you know, we, we could kind of fudge it right there. Don't do that thing because that's bad and you should be embarrassed as a security person. Actually, sometimes I've been embarrassed. But uh, it's been long and uh, fraught with guilt. So don't do that thing. PCI can actually help you become more secure if you let it. Don't, don't go the easy route just because it's easier. You can achieve both security and compliance. One of the other pitfalls is no roadmap to completion. If you just tell your management, ah, we're going to become PCI compliant, they're going to ask you, OK, what does that mean? You say, well, right now, you're here with me. We're not PCI compliant. We're going to do some stuff. And then we will be PCI compliant. Not, first off, your management isn't going to really buy that unless they have no idea what you're doing in your job. Uh, second off, you're going to have a really hard time completing it because you're always going to find something that I isn't, isn't quite right. You don't quite understand it. Uh, you should have a plan for completion, draw up a roadmap, uh, use a simple project, or not simple, but standard project management technique in order to define where you're going to be and get an estimate of how long that's going to be. Now, don't be afraid to call in a consultant. If, if you really have no idea where you're going, and you just feel lost, and it's causing a decrease in your health and your family life and stuff. You know, look at a consultant because you know the couple hundred dollars per hour that they're going to spend uh, with a consultant is probably worth it because they can answer a bunch of questions. They might be an authoritative QSA, and you can have them come in not necessarily as a QSA doing an external audit on you, in which case you're going to be paying them a lot more money, but. They can come in just kind of as a friend and tell you, hey, you know, with other clients that I've worked with for whom I am a QSA, this is what we've recommended. 
you know, we have established that these controls that you already have in place, they're okay, they're good enough, you're good. Pull the stress down a little bit. So, pillow time. The SAQ has 12 different sections, or four different categories that are divided into 12 different questions. And uh, I thought we'd just march through them as quickly as possible, because realistically, I don't want to keep you guys, you know, 50 minutes doing that. But if you have any questions, please, you know, a raise of hand doesn't hurt. And I will give you kind of a summary of what we did in going through those particular sections. Okay, so the first one talks about firewall protecting data. You have requirements like you need to have firewall rules for ingress and egress around the CHD. Again, that's the, that's the card holder data, or the CDE, the card holder data environment. Um, they really don't want your database that has card holder data on it to be able to reach out to the internet um, unrestrictedly. Weird. So you need to have firewalls up. You also need to have firewalls around your corporate infrastructure to help um, minimize leak through data breaches where somebody brings in, you know, some, somebody gets compromised on the inside and that becomes a jumping point for, for an attacker. And again, in our case, it was kind of a funny situation because um, not only do we not touch the credit card data, but also our corporate or our production network is up in AWS. So we still have firewalls. In fact, our wireless and our network in, in our corporate environment is almost like a McDonald's when it comes to connectivity with our production network. You, you just, you can't get there from here. There's a really great phrase for that in Russian, but maybe you guys probably don't all speak Russian. Okay, vendor supply defaults. This one is actually pretty short and not too difficult. Uh, you do need to minimize the number of um, services that are actually on your servers and in your environment. So they don't want to have like your, I don't know, ping pong tournament server right next to your uh, cardholder data server. Uh, and, and worse, they don't want them on the same server. You need to kind of restrict all the service, all the servers down to kind of very single purpose items. Uh, if you have virtual machines, that works out really, really well. Uh, if you don't, just try and trim things down. Change your Tomcat passwords if you're using Tomcat. Uh, change your root passwords if you're using some kind of um, knowable in industry standard password there. You just, you need to make sure that the really, really low hanging fruit that like your average script kitty can exploit it is not, not quite so blatantly in their face. So uh, pull those things back. Protecting cardholder data. Now to me this seems like kind of obvious and in your face, but because um, that's the whole, the whole idea behind PCI. Uh, this talks about like data retention and protection, pan masking, encryption. If you don't store PCI data on your servers, at, within your corporation, your life will be so much simpler. So if possible, don't store PCI data. In fact, if you can make it, if if you can make it to where you don't actually touch the PCI data, that's even better. Uh, but this again, there's a there's a whole bunch of restrictions on this, and you have to have redundant controls, and it can be a real pain. But this this is the this is one that we got to avoid as a company. And when I walked through it, uh, I was happy that that was the case. Uh, encrypted transmission. Uh, this is one of the funny ones because there's this whole like nonsense between TLS 1.0 and TLS 1.2. Um, basically, if you're making a new application or you've never become PCI compliant yet, you have to use a better TLS than 1.0. If you do, you're not compliant or actually, yeah, you do. Now, if you are already PCI compliant, uh, the council has ruled that that uh, TLS 1.0, and I'm trying to remember 1.1. You have to look in the SAQ. Okay, so you have to have, uh, it sounds like PCI 1.2 would be required, and honestly, it's not that hard to update things. Yeah. Yeah, TLS. So if you can, uh, get everything up to 1.2. We ran into a funny scenario where we were using CloudFront, and CloudFront was communicating with our services, 
and it turns out that like in Amazon CloudFront, TLS 1.0 was the furthest encryption algorithm available. And so when we switched everything to 1.2, that part of the system broke. And uh, you know everybody's like, ah! And uh, freaking out from an ops perspective. We, for that, for that uh, certification, had to actually go in and put in, uh, we use this escape clause that PCI has built in. It says, if you were already compliant, just have a plan of when you're going to be, uh, you know, have a plan of when you're going to be running TLS 1.2. Um, obviously, don't use WEP in your wireless protocols. I, I still see that as well in like corporations. I went over to it was a doctor's office too, of all places. I went and told them I was like, your wireless network is really insecure. And the receptionist looked at me like, who are you? What are you talking about? I'm like, just write these words on a note and give it to your IT guy. And I don't know what she ever did. She probably was just like, yeah, okay. Being the trash. So um, number five, protect all systems against malware and regularly update antivirus software or program. One of, the, one of my favorite requirements is actually in here. Because we get, um, I don't know if, if your corporations uh, get these all the time, but we get security questionnaires uh, because we offer a service and people want to make sure that uh, we are secure because we're going to be touching their data. Uh, all the time they're like, we want you to have antivirus installed on every single machine that you own. And we're like, that, that isn't really feasible. That, I mean, that would really kill a lot of our production machines that are really not doing anything particularly important in terms of security. It would be great. Like, I'd be so happy if I could do that. But it would cause way more pain than my business people will be able to tolerate. In PCI, the wording is more along the lines of, have malware protection on machines commonly afflicted by malware. <coughs> Windows. That's, uh, and I was actually really happy for that because that made my job a whole lot easier. Also, they talk about SIEM, or SIM. They talk about logging and retention. You need to be able to conjure up at least three months of logging data on pretty much all of your security systems. You need to have them in a centralized, non-repudiatable Unreputable, unreputable uh, system for storing logs. Uh, developing and maintaining secure systems and applications. So you need to have a software development lifecycle, and if you don't have that, then shame on you. Um, get on your engineers, because otherwise it's going to be really hard to even have a business. I'm not sure what's happening there, but you need to have a security part of that. Change management is really important, both in your source code as well as in your um, actual configuration management. So your firewall settings and all that stuff. You need to be able to definitively say, this is the way things are because we put them that way. Uh, in the case of source code, you need to be able to say, so-and-so is not the only person who knew that this code was going into the mix. Somebody else, peer review, looked at that and said it's good. And that's kind of just a basic fraud thing. Restrict access to the data on a need-to-know basis. Um, this one, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. If, if somebody doesn't need access, there's no point in giving it to them. And that is true whether or not you're using a third-party source or you know, you're actually holding the card data yourself. Uh, we use a company called Recurly. Uh, they're pretty awesome. And we don't want to give just anybody in our company access to Recurly. That, that would be insane. And it would cause me a whole lot of heartache, and I'd probably quit. So I'm glad they don't do that. Uh, identify and authenticate access to system components. Don't use shared passwords. Uh, that was kind of the biggest one. There's like It feels like there's 20 different questions that talk about using shared credentials. Don't do that. In our case, we use a certificate key pairs as well as passwords in order to authenticate to the environment. And that has gone a long way towards helping us feel confident in our security posture. Uh, if you guys can do that same kind of thing, I think that it would definitely help you. Um, provide training. Uh, that's a fun one. That's actually one of my favorites. And, and password policy is not one of my favorites. Everybody hates me because of that. Um, and remote access policy. Any questions on that, by the way? Unique logins, that kind of thing. 
uh, restricting physical access to cardholder data. Again, in our case, this didn't make a whole lot of sense because um, there is no way in the world that somebody from my company could march up to Amazon and demand access to the servers that you know, held our data, uh, any of our data. Amazon would laugh us uh, all the way down the street. So that wasn't too bad, but if you are holding credit card data within your own data center, or you have access to the data center, you must restrict and log and have cameras and all of that fun stuff. Uh, not only that, but if your salespeople are taking credit card numbers over the phone, you need to be able to restrict who has access to that number. Uh, good things to remember that come into play there are, are your sales calls being recorded? Where are those recordings being held? That kind of stuff. Uh, little things like that can totally bite you out of the blue and are a really good argument for why you should have a QSA. Even if they're not going to come do a full audit, have them come and act as an advisor in some of these things. Explain your, uh, explain how you're set up, what you're doing, where your data flows are. Uh, and that means data flows, whether they're by you know, word of mouth, over the phone, um, or whether they get written down on a piece of paper and then shredded. But there's, I mean, if you're looking for a good reason to get a whole bunch of hardware on your hands, this is a good one. Uh, track and monitor all access, network resources, and cardholder data. You not only need to protect where the cardholder data is actually residing, but the network that it passes through as it gets outside. So you, you encrypt the cardholder data, and unless you have endpoint, end-to-end uh, -end encryption between where the cardholder data is initially and the bank, and, and you can assure that the, the SSR TLS restrictions are correctly functioning there, you have to actually go and protect all of the lines as they sync through your, co your corporation. Uh, in our case, uh, we were looking at this, and it would have meant uh, putting cameras and stuff outside of our server room that we use in our, in our corporate environment. Regularly test security systems and processes. Just like in anything good, setting it up is not good enough. You have to test it. Make sure that it actually is working. Take the adversarial mindset, come in and say, hey, if somebody offered me like $10 million to come breach this system, and for some reason it wasn't ethically wrong, how would I do it? And if you ask people that way, you'd be surprised at the types of answers you'd get. Now realistically, uh, again, Bludgeoning somebody over the head is likely to be the best way, but don't go that far, even if it's tempting. Okay, last one. Maintain a policy that addresses information security for all personnel. So this can be a little bit of a little bit of a beast if you don't have an information security program. And what I mean by information security program in that constant context is you know a whole truckload of papers and policies defining how you provide security at that company. Uh, these are like uh, acceptable use policies, data retention policies, change management policies, all of those things. Um, most of those are actually required by PCI, and, and they can be a little bit of a beast to generate the first time. Um, there are several governmental entities that have, however, provided template documents for these policies that you can use, and I do suggest that you use them. Um, Make sure to proofread them first. I'm pretty sure that yeah, when I came in and we revamped some of the documents, I found I found instances of where we were being referenced as a telecommunications uh, provider, which was uh, not exactly accurate and a little bit confusing. I'm sure to anybody else who noticed it. Uh, responsibility matrix matrices. Uh, this is an attempt by the PCI Council to really peg down and force you to peg down who is responsible for what and where is the finger going to be undeniably pointed. Because uh, prior to this, basically when a breach would occur, everybody points at the other guy and says, it's his fault because he didn't do X, Y, and Z, and the other dude's like, no way, we did this, and you forgot about that, and it becomes kind of a big litigation mess that makes everybody except for the lawyers quite a bit poorer. Um, this matrix basically says anything that you do not explicitly define to your third party providers and say, Say like Recurly, for example, we have explicit language that says Recurly is in charge of protecting this data once it's in their systems. Unless you have that kind of language there, it's your fault. 
even if the breach is on their side. So you set up these responsibility matrices most of the time. I mean, it in contract, it says they are responsible for X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, uh, you are. <sighs> so that's the end of the presentation. I hope you guys got um, a, a good nap, if nothing else. Remember, get your scoping right. Get your scoping right. That will cause the most undue stress out of anything in here. Start the process early. Don't expect you're going to you're gonna be done in a week or two. You may not be w done in a month or two. And you really don't want that to become your full-time, all-consuming job for a month. Believe me, it's not fun. Uh, don't be afraid to call in a consultant. Again, it, it, sometimes it's hard to justify the business, especially, and I understand this, when you're supposed to be the security expert, it's really hard to call in somebody else because it's kind of one of these humbling experiences that I don't know. But realistically, in this field, you probably don't know everything. And um, don't be afraid to say it because it'll make your life so much easier. And as always, with any security presentation, stay vigilant. Um, don't go to the dark side. Any questions or complaints about PCI? I'm open to them both. It's so over the phone is a really fun one, and it's messy. And if possible, avoid it. If you're a small enough company that you can kind of push your users into using the web portal, do that. That being said, uh, any large company is going to have to do stuff over the phone, and it's going to involve credit cards sometimes. You need to be able to protect your side of the infrastructure. You can't go to the telecom company and make sure that they are doing everything in the world that they're supposed to. They're going to, again, laugh you to the door. You have to make sure they're reputable. Like, don't just go buy internet access from some shady dude on the corner uh, unless he has some really good credentials that you, that you can back up. But once it comes into your system, you need to be able to secure the VoIP traffic, especially, I mean, if it's VoIP. If it's just over the wire, you need to be able to control those wires and ensure that nobody's coming in and tapping off of them. It's kind of a pain, but it is the way of things. Um, easiest way to do that is have it be simple. Keep your infrastructure simple. Um, don't, for example, decide to wind your voice cables, you know, all over the, all over the company. Um, if you're doing VoIP, it's easier if you have separate systems, one for like a, a VoIP network, and then your normal corporate network. That makes things a little bit easier, and my understanding is just general good sense. But ultimately, you have to be able to secure the lines and the voice data. So that data is not going to be on those lines forever. It's going to probably get saved somewhere, and then you have to save that file storage, or you have to secure that file storage as well. Anything else? Okay, thank you so much, guys. It's kind of a beast, but that's PCI for you. Again, anything red and tapey. Uh, good luck with your experience, and uh, hopefully you have a better one than I did, and you don't feel the need to come up and save everybody from the woes that you made. But have a good day, and enjoy the rest of the conference.